Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today I'm happy to welcome back by popular demand one of the most beloved special guests we've ever had on our show, the incomparably delicious Ruta Lee. Her book, Consider Your Ass Kissed, has generated renewed interest in her stage, screen, and television career spanning more than six decades. She's widely considered to be the grand dam of Hollywood, not only because of her track record as one of the hardest working performers on stage and screen, but most importantly, because of her lifetime of volunteerism and philanthropy, especially with the Thalians, an organization bringing awareness and support for the critical issue of mental health. Today, we're going to continue our discussion of her amazing life and career. My dear Ruta, thank you so much for coming back to our show. Oh, Harvey, I'm delighted to be with you and your followers. And what a lovely introduction. Oh, my, 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 my. You know, the title of my book is Consider Your Ass Kissed. Well, I mean it, darlings. I mean it. I know you do. You know, you're such a pleasure to interview, not only because you're such a great raconteur and you have so much warmth, but because you were an interviewer yourself, especially on Talk of the Town for five years. And you also did After Dark. So you know how to give a great interviewer because you were a great interviewer. Do you know that my first experience as an interviewer was with Regis Philbin? I did two and a half hours live every day with him on KHJ here and its sister station in New York. And it was an amazing experience to sit on the other side. And so I thought, I'm not really trained for this, but all I did was think in terms of what would I like to know? What would I really like to know about this person? What would the world like to know along with me? You know, this big secret that we have, this wonderful interview. And it seemed to work out very, very well. So I enjoy both sides of it. I enjoy your part. I enjoy my part. Hell, I just enjoy visiting with everybody. I wonder why you never did have your own talk show. I mean, you're a natural. Everyone in Hollywood would have come on the show because everybody loves you. And you know how to make a conversation. You were a perfect fit. Well, you know, it's amazing that I've never done a talk show. Well, other than with Regis every day. That was certainly a talk show. And I, I would still love to do it. I'm getting to a place now. I'm an old broad, you know. And I'm getting to a place of where I kind of want to take, lay back a little bit and not do as much. And Harvey, I've obviously been lying to myself all these years when I thought, as I get older, when I get into my 80s, I'm going to slow down. Ha! It hasn't happened yet. I don't see it happening for a long time. That's because there was a mistake in your birth certificate. You are nowhere near 80. Have you looked in the mirror lately? You're nowhere near 80. Oh, bless you. I, I thank uh, Dun and Edwards Paint for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start by asking you about some of the great stars that you got to know so well. You devoted an entire chapter in your book to Lucille Ball, and you appeared on The Lucy Show, of course. The one I remember the most is the one with Milton Berle. And in your book, you described her, and I'm quoting you here, as a very, very demanding taskmaster. But you yes. absolutely adored her, didn't you? Absolutely. She was a taskmaster in that when you're working the four camera system, which some of your audience may not understand, instead of one movie camera shooting the way we always think of it, there are four cameras shooting the same action at the same time, but from a different point of view. And when you stage that scene, it's very, very much like learning a ballet because you have to hit certain marks at a certain time so that your nose and ear aren't in somebody else's close-up because it's dependent on where the camera is and where you have to be. She broke little foolishness about not being able to hit your marks or know your lines at the right time. But boy, was she ever fun. And what a great and generous dame she was. And I say dame lovingly. She was the great broad too. You know, I mean, she was... She was everything you wanted in a lady. The only thing that was wrong, and I write about this in the book, is food was never of importance to her. 
Now she was married to a Jewish man after she split with Desi. And you'd think that that refrigerator in that house would be filled with salami and cheese and pastrami and kugel and things. Feh. You went to her house, you came home hungry. <laughs> But you played great games. Oh, she used to love to play games. And what a treat it was for me to be in her coterie of friends and playing charades, which is what she really loved then, with Carol Burnett and, and Carol Cook and, and Dick Godier and Barbara Stewart. It was just totally amazing to leave that evening, but you'd obviously have to stop and get a hamburger on the way home because you went home hungry. Now I know why she was so thin all the time. She was thin, and she was just remarkable in those fantastic legs and her, her, well, just her whole attitude was just so wonderful. I, I was so happy to be so much a part of her life that she took me in. I mean, I was there for Lucy's, her daughter's first wedding, and uh, then she got married in New York the second time, but we're still neighbors in Palm Springs and we see each other occasionally, which is awfully nice. And when Lucy died, little Lucy gave me a whole bunch of Lucy scarves. You know how she always wore them either this way or tied up on her head. And I, I, every time I put one on, I can sense Lucy's arms giving me a hug and saying, go get it, kid, go get it. I can hear her saying it. Another one, you wrote in your book that Debbie Reynolds was the most generous person you ever met. Am I yes. right that she was your very best friend in show business? Yes, I would say yes, because we spent a lot of years together. Debbie was one of the founding members of the Thalians. And the Thalians is a group that was founded by a lot of young actors and people in allied show business fields, agents, writers, producers, you know, that sort of thing. And they said, you know, we get together, we hang around the piano, we sing, we dance. Why don't we put a little show together? We'll, we'll sell a few tickets and we'll raise some money for a worthwhile cause, a charity. And so who do they send out to find out what a good charity is to give our money to? But Jane Mansfield and, oh my goodness, the other blonde with the big boobs, uh, Oh, I'll think I'll call you at two in the morning. I think it okay. was Mamie Van Doren. Mamie Van Doren, thank you very, very much. The minute I said big boobs, you knew. <laughs> and boy, between them, holy mackerel, they cornered the bra market. Uh, <laughs> but they came back to the next meeting and said, Well, all the good diseases have been taken. In other words, <laughs> charity have already taken the uh, underwing. And but they found a doctor who was dealing with emotionally disturbed children. And so that's what we did. We took on mental health. And Debbie was one of the founding members. And of course, we did shows every year that were totally spectacular. I mean, we honored everybody from Frank Sinatra through Lucille Ball, through Liza Minnelli, through Whoopi Goldberg, everybody in the world that not only was famous and wonderful and dazzled us with their performances on the screen, but who also were dazzling in their performances as philanthropists. And well, while you're at that point, I want to know why those shows were never televised or filmed. They should have been, but then you have to go through so much signing off on everything. And somebody it already works for a sponsor here and therefore you don't know if the sponsor is gonna conflict there. They should have been. Some of them were secretly kind of filmed on, on little itty bitty cameras. I mean, we're talking the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, you know, before you got into the really good stuff. So I don't know why, but we never did. We did try a couple of times, but it just became such a complicated legal issue between unions and between sponsorship and between buyers and oh so that it sort of became to hell with it let's just do the darn thing and, and make the money that we do but what glorious events they were oh they were wonderful 
And your friendship with Debbie Reynolds, of course, solidified because of your very hard and long work with the Thalians. But one thing that really fascinated me when I read your book was that despite how close you and Debbie were, she never even once told you about all the financial trouble she was having at different times in her life. And you were her right. best friend. I was one of, well, certainly one of her best friends, but she never wanted to burden anybody with anything. And there were literally times that she slept in her car with her kids because one of her wonderful husbands did her in, you know, financially. And she married a man that was older, very wealthy, very generous when he had the bucks. And she didn't know that he had the gambling gene. And he lost not only all of his money, but he lost all of her money, which was not billions of dollars. But I mean, it was money that she earned from the time she was a little girl in the movies that was put aside. And that girl never took bankruptcy. She wouldn't do that. She went out and tap danced her ass off across America in every show imaginable, working in every venue she could possibly find. Of course, thank God she also had Broadway, which came along when she did Irene, all of which meant that while she was gone, guess who was head mother now? I was both president and chairman of the board because I was filling two roles. And she was the first to say, if it hadn't been for Ruta, there would not have been a Thalians. We would have oh. lost it a long time ago. Everyone in Hollywood has told me that. That's absolutely true. Now tell us about Mary Martin. She was your idol, wasn't she? Absolutely my idol. She was able to do everything that I ever wanted to do. And I thank God got to play a lot of the roles that she brought to Broadway and to the world. I never played them on Broadway, I'm sorry to say, but I did around the country. And then I invited her to be our honoree when we wanted a star for the Thalian Ball that year. And I met her through her sister and through uh, my then beloved hairdresser in Texas, where I, I played every year for 40 years. And I met her sister and she said, darling, Ruta, you just the same as Mary, darling. You're just the same. You act, you act, you talk, you walk, you do dance, you do everything just like my Mary. So that was my introduction to darling Mary Martin. And my heart was in my mouth when I was doing Honey Bun to the queen herself, who was sitting right there in the front row of the Thalians. And, and it was a very exciting night. And then she came to the house and we saw each other in Palm Springs and occasionally back here in LA. She was a delicious, wonderful lady who was not full of herself. She was just full of life and gave it to the theater and gave it to the stage. And I'm so proud and happy to know that God gave me a gift. And that was the friendship of Mary Martin. Oh, yeah. I, I can only imagine how you felt when you met the people that you idolized. I mean, you're a star, but you're also a fan, too. I am. I, I am truly a fan, and I'm, I'm still that way. Had dinner last night with two of my girlfriends. One of my best friends is Ann Gillian, who you, you will remember from her series and also from Sugar Babies, which made her a star on Broadway. And, uh, and Sally Struthers, the wonderful Miss Gloria from, from our, all of the family, and so much more. I mean, she also, that's all we really ever remember her for, but she also starred on Broadway and all over the country. And we had such a good time. And, you know, you sort of feel when you have these friends that it's going to go on forever. But life changes, you know, it, you, you get moved to a different part of the country or a different set of friends have suddenly become the prairies in your life. But thank God, I do keep my friends forever and ever and ever. 
I don't make fans, I always say. I think you've heard me say this before. I make friends. I feel like I'm very open with people and I'm very, very open to receiving and amenable to a friendship with everybody and anybody. And I think it's great. I do too. I get myself into trouble though. (laughs) Uh, Judy, my darling assistant, will often say, you know, you've sent this lovely note to somebody. They now think they're they're your best friend and they're going to be over for dinner every night. And I go, ooh. (laughs) I can't quite get everybody in every night, but I do try. Yes, you are known for being so accessible and so, and you're so beloved. You've probably got more friends than anybody else in Hollywood. And one of the big ones was Phyllis Diller. You were really good friends with her. An angel that God gave to me too. We, we knew each other for so very, very many years. The first time I met her, everything the world knew about all of her facelifts and everything that she had done and i said why honey why are you doing so many and she said the one thing i want to do in this life is to die beautiful (laughs) so she did and uh, i was with her shortly before she died for her birthday debbie reynolds and, and i and alex trebek went over and brought potluck we each brought a dish of some kind and Debbie made like the maid because I don't know where her lady was or whether they were no longer on staff or whatever but uh, we had the best time together and of course she loved her martinis I think that was mother's milk to to my darling Phyllis and she would drink either gin martinis which I don't like or vodka didn't matter but she really loved her Marty so we always had one of those big lovely glasses with a lot of different veggies and things in it for her vodka salad we'd make for her and uh, what a precious gift she was well let me ask you when you were with people like Lucille Ball and you've mentioned Sally Struthers and Debbie Reynolds and Phyllis Diller do you think these stars who are really legends did they understand? Do you think they really got how how beloved they were by the public? I don't know that they ever really sensed it because you you they were all in their own way humble. They were plain people. And that kind of adulation you only see at big events. And of course you're you're guarded and protected at great big major events. And of course the thousands of letters that come, but if you're lucky enough to have some assistance, they're they're sort of covered and then you sign and you sign and you sign. I'm not sure that anybody ever understands. I'm, I'm not even sure that the Beatles understood that kind of adulation from the public. I don't know that they had to, well, you had to because your life becomes impossible when you're out and you, you can't sit down at a table. Frank Sinatra had a very, very open and, and loving and easy attitude with his public. And he never got pissed with anything unless, and he got pissed easily about this. If he was, and I use this example, if he was putting a fork full of spaghetti into his mouth and somebody came up and grabbed his arm and said, Frank, I want you to meet my mother or my sister or my girlfriend or whatever. Can I have your autograph? That would take him off. And I can say, I can understand why. Uh, you want some privacy, even though you're a public person. And I, I always urge fans to be aggressive in trying to read them, but don't be aggressive with that someone, because that tends to pull people back and not leave them open to your loving smile and your need for an autograph or, or a hello. Uh, so I just ask everybody always be aware of their private moments too, and, and let people eat or have their drink without a big in- interruption. You know, it's funny you should say that. You're taking me back to the early 80s, Carol Burnett was making a movie here in Toronto with Elizabeth Taylor, of all people. And I had a friend that was working at their hotel and 
he told me where they were going to have dinner. So I made a reservation and I saw them, they, they were seated in a corner and I waited until the meal was over. And then as they were leaving, I ran up to uh, Elizabeth Taylor left right away, but Carol went to every single employee and thanked them. And I got to go up to her and I got her to sign my napkin. And she said to me, I'm really grateful that you waited until I finished my meal. Oh, <laughs> so you just put a period on what I talked about. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's, um, I know people get all caught up in, in the excitement of the moment and, and sort of forget, but it's very, very much like Carol said, appreciated that you wait until there's a lull. <laughs> yeah. You know how, how wonderful she was. I asked her to sign my napkin and she said, I'll do better than that. You put your address on this napkin and I will send you an autographed picture. And I thought to myself, Oh, great. She's never going to do it. I'll never ever get the picture, but she did it. Three days later, I got an autographed picture in the mail. Three days. Wow. That was fast. I was so amazed. If now said three months, I would have said, okay, no, three days. Now, Ruda, you were exceptionally popular on game shows like password. You don't say stump the stars, Hollywood squares. And of course you hosted high rollers with Alex Trebek. Mm -hmm. I, when I used to watch you, I thought to myself, the reason you were so good on these shows is that it's not just your personality. You work well without a script. You think quickly on your feet. You make a very good game show star. Don't you think because of that ability? I, I think that has a great deal to do with it. I have this unbelievably big energy that now I'm beginning to think is, is a curse rather than a blessing. But, but that energy certainly translated on camera and the enthusiasm with which I would approach any game. It was always life and death, you know, to play the game, which, which was really, really great. And, you know, Harvey, I am so grateful to the game and the talk shows, the unscripted shows, because they introduced Ruta Lee as herself to an audience rather than the mother of two little babies or a hooker with a heart of gold and teeth to match or some junkie, you know, that I was portraying. So audiences invited me into their living rooms or their kitchens or their bedrooms or their bathrooms uh, as Ruta Lee. And that was very, very satisfying and very gratifying to know that I, I built a base of friends that would always be there. And I'm so grateful to anybody that ever turned the TV set on because I was going to be there or came to the theater to see me or bought a, a movie ticket. I, I, to this day, I say, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being there and being my friends and consider your ass kissed. And we do. I love your description of Paul Lind who appeared with you on Hollywood Squares. You said he was venomously bitchy. Oh, yes, especially after a couple of drinks. Uh, he was darling and funny and adorable when sober. A little bit bitchy, nasty when he was a little sloshed. But he was so frigging funny that it kind of didn't matter. And you excuse that bad behavior because it was worth the laugh. Well, I want to get into something here. Uh, everyone knows Paul Lind was gay. You've known a number of stars who were gay, but very much in the closet to protect their careers. People like Jim Neighbors, Paul Lind, Rock Hudson, Raymond Burr, Tab Hunter. Now, you said in the book that everyone in Hollywood knew they were gay, but kept it a secret. Do you think a lot has changed in Hollywood for gay men? Because I get the feeling there's still lots of gay actors too afraid to come out. Well, I think they're afraid to come out because they don't want to lose that inspiration for the, the, the young women in the audience because ticket sales are usually driven by the women of any family, you know? Uh, that's who decides what movie we're going to or what play we're going to go see or whatever. I don't think anybody really gives a damn anymore 
in Hollywood. I don't think that they ever really gave a damn. It was it was sort of oh well you know uh, that that he's gay. When you really stop and think about it, Ray Burr, who was this big beautiful man, who never made it to real leading man, you know, the leading man position in movies because he always had a weight problem. And he had, as you know, the most wonderful face and the most gorgeous eyes with the longest lashes. I was jealous and and a wild, wild sense of humor. Uh, Obviously the people that like to laugh and that make me laugh are the ones that I love best. And I always admired him and always thought he was so gorgeous to look at. What a shame that he wasn't a leading man. But that was kept very quiet. But Ray Burr did a lot of theater, too. And I do distinctly remember that when I guessed it on Perry Mason, which I did a lot. Thank you. Thank you. He had a beautiful friend, Russell. Evelyn Russell, I believe is her name. She was absolutely gorgeous, and she was constantly with Ray for openings of this or the premiere of that or an appearance here, and uh, she was gay. And, of course, nobody was talking about gay females then. It was way back when. And she was most attractive and most feminine-looking. Very short haircut, but just great-looking. And they were so pretty together that it... It covered a lot of territory and and it squelched a lot of kind of rumor that maybe floated about. But those of us in the business knew, uh, of course, that he was gay and loved him. But in those days, the media was prepared to keep people's secrets. Of course. And now I don't think that would happen. Of course. Stop. Just look at President Kennedy, for heaven's sake. The world, most of it, knew there were such goings on in the bedrooms in that administration. And nobody talked about it in the press. And wasn't that nice? Rather than schmear stories. I, I, I wish we were back in those days, frankly. I, I, I really don't want to know what everybody's doing in the privacy of their bedroom. Let it be. Who cares? Let us think about it, not, not know about it. I think being a celebrity now is extremely different than what it was, you know, when you were in your 30s and 40s. I I guess it is. It hasn't been for me. I've been very blessed. Of course, I'm very open about who I am and and what I do and and what I prefer. And, and, uh, you know, I'm a a rah-rah patriot and I make no bones about it. I want everybody to believe in what they believe and and do what they do, so long as it doesn't harm somebody else. Uh, Let everybody live their lives. Uh, God made us all just a little bit different, but he did make us all. And we are his creatures and we have to, we may not have to love each other, but we sure have to respect each other. And that's my credo. So well put. Now, there's a quote in your book about your approach to being a performer that I just love, Ruta. You wrote, technical ability is 10% of what you bring to a performance. If you can sell it, it doesn't matter what your feet are doing. It's all in the attitude. Whether you're dancing, singing, acting, whatever, sell it with all your heart. Ruta, you've done that all your life, haven't you? I've done it all my life, not just on stage. I do it in my life. Every day, if we're, if we're going to do something, let's do it with our full, undivided attention and with a full, loving heart. Sometimes I wear myself out <laughs> in the process, but, but it's, uh, it sends me to bed tired at night in a happy way. Well, you know, even though you've appeared in hundreds of movies and TV shows, you've always considered yourself a true stage animal, but you turned down the chance to do company on Broadway. Why? No, I didn't turn it down. They turned it down. (laughs) I don't remember how that happened. Well, I do remember. Uh, Yeah, yeah. It was the days of my really beginnings in Hollywood. And I was 
making the average amount of money that everybody made, you know, the, the top of the, the show. And I was auditioned here in L.A. to replace one of the ladies in company. And I uh, came in and auditioned for Mr. Prince, Hal Prince. He should be Mr. King because he is the king of Broadway. And uh, they made inquiry as to what my availabilities might be, et cetera. And when I found out that people in my position who were newcomers to Broadway were maybe making, if they were lucky, very lucky, they might be making between three and $500 a week. And I was making at least seven fifty to fifteen hundred dollars a week guesting on a television show i thought how would i get an apartment in new york how would i get cab fare to get to the theater how would i be able to eat how would i be able to do any of that on three hundred to, to five hundred dollars a week and i said no thanks i'll just stay here in town obviously i should have because if ever there was a broadway baby it was me, but I never got to, to dance on, on Broadway. Uh, well, it's never too late. I might still. You know what? I think it could happen. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I'd love it. I would love it. It would be a, a, a lovely experience. Now, earlier you talked about the Thalians ball. I was surprised to read in your book that you often had difficulty persuading big stars to agree to be the honoree at the ball. Why? why? Well, I suppose that they were asked by lots of people. I remember when I asked Shirley Temple, who was indeed a friend, and, and we planned this glorious event around Shirley Temple. Of course, any event around her would be great. And she would not do it in spite of good friends. And I said, but surely why? And she said, because I have been asked by this charity and this charity and this charity and this charity and this charity. And if I do yours, they're all going to be mad as hell at me. And I could understand that. You know, I, I could understand that. So I imagine that a lot of celebrities have that feeling, plus which most celebrities know that they're being used for their name and their star appeal. Uh, of course they are. And they're worried that they are going to have to approach their coterie of friends uh, and business acquaintances and their cleaner and their housemaid to contribute to the charity or to buy a ticket or to buy a program ad or something or other. And they don't want to take that on. So we Thalians made our pitch a little different. And that was, we said, you don't have to do a bloody thing, but turn up in your tuxedo or your gown, smile for the cameras and the press on the, on the red carpet, go in, sit down, have a dinner, have drinks, and watch your friends and peers in the business entertain you. And that's all you have to do, and then get up and say thank you and, and get your award. So I think I talked a lot of people into it. Do you know that it took me 20 years to get Clint Eastwood? I mean, and he was a good friend, but it was always, no, 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 that he was going to be in China. No, he was going to be in Africa. No, he was going to be up north in Maine. Uh, anything, you know, that he couldn't do it, he couldn't do it. And I finally talked him into it. And he was the most gracious, wonderful honoree. Boy, were the Thalians ever lucky to have you as their, you know, grand dam going out there and trying to get these stars to say yes. Because the public, you know, I was surprised when I read your book. I had the idea that stars love being honored and receiving uh, awards. I think they find it work. And it is work. Look, any appearance is work. To be smiling and jolly jump ups for every adorable Tom, Dick, and Harry that crosses your path, it takes energy and it takes stamina to, to do that and to keep nice, you know, and smiling when you say, I just want to sit down and have a drink, you know, but, but 
everybody was absolutely gracious. I mean, Mary was incredible. Carol Channing was just too adorable for words. Whoopi was wonderful. Everybody was wonderful. Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, stop and think about all of those gorgeous people. Van Johnson and, and uh, Ann Miller. We called it Ann and Van. We put them together. It was just great. Ann and Van, a hell of an evening. Well, that's one of the most enjoyable parts of your book is that I felt like I was having a conversation with you over dinner and you were regaling me with these wonderful experiences you've had. I really could hear your voice and I, I it felt like a, a visit with a dear friend. I thank you. That is the greatest compliment. And you are not the first person to say that. Critics, you know, authors, critics, have said that they could hear my voice in it. And that is so important to me. Being a first time author, I'm, I'm thrilled to death that it, it catches people and, and, and keeps them. I've, I've heard that from so many people. I, I have to get another book out. You know, Harvey, I think we may have talked about this before that I dedicated one chapter to the story of getting my grandmother out of Siberia, then back to Lithuania, and to getting her out of communist Soviet Union and into the freedom and the blessing of the United States, or Canada, as the case may be, lots of Lithuanians in Canada. And it, it, I gave it short shrift. I need to really expand on that and do this fascinating juxtaposition of a little Tootsie becoming a known person in Hollywood and to America and Canada where she was born and to bringing over this little old lady from having been tormented by 15 years in Siberia and for what? Nobody could ever explain that. This was not part of the intelligentsia. This was not a writer or a teacher or an artist or a poet. This was a little farm woman who maybe had a cow, you know, and, and why they were shipped off to Siberia, nobody could ever explain, other than the Soviets were trying to repatriate Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania with Russians, you know, and to Russify everything. But uh, anyway, I think it deserves a lot more than I gave it, and it would make a wonderful book. And then I would like for it to be a movie and I'm trying to figure out who'll play me. <laughs> That's the big question. And when we talk about the young celebrities, actually, you've just segued nicely. You said in the book that the young generation of celebrities don't feel the same obligation to give back to the community as the old stars did. And they want expensive perks before they'll agree to show up at a big charity event. That is so disappointing to read that. You know, Harvey, I have to say, that I, I say that, but but I, I'm guarded about it because I'm never sure if you get to the celebrity in person, I think most celebrities are very willing to help and do, and they are generous, but they're surrounded by a phalanx of representation, agents, managers, hairstylists, masseuses, uh, uh, personal secretaries, that whose job it is to kind of keep them free of all of that. And unless there is a good price to be gotten for the celebrity, then the manager doesn't get the 15%, the agent doesn't get 15%, the, the masseuse doesn't get to make the massage. You know what I'm saying. Everybody gets a piece of the action. And charities, of course, pay book uh, We're We're delighted if, if they, most celebrities that really come and do for us will say, forget the limousine, you don't have to spend the money, I'll get there myself, I don't need anything. Now there are some celebrities who will say, okay, I'll come, but you'll have to have first class transportation for myself and my either husband or associate or somebody. I'll be bringing my musical conductor, the band and the, the string guy, maybe they have to come too, all, all first class, You'll have to put us up at the hotel where the event is, or better than that. 
And, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, there will be a Rolex at the end, won't there? And, uh, and you have to cover a table of 12. I'll be bringing that many people. Well, there go your profits. And that's what happens unless you get to somebody right straight on. You know, I mean, I picked up the phone and called Frank Sinatra and said, come and do, or Dean Martin or Sammy Davis or any of these marvelous people that came and did what they had to do. And I'm sure that they could do this every night of their lives and they probably get very tired of it. But if it's a special friend begging, then of course they'll come through and they're most generous. But Debbie was without a doubt one of the most generous people I've ever known. Well, so was Frank Sinatra. He was incredibly generous and very few people knew how generous he was. Well, they know if they read your book. Ruta, I saved the best for the last, the best part of your book, your marriage to the most wonderful man on earth, Webb Lowe. You were together 46 years before he passed away, which is extremely rare in Hollywood. He used to say that you were the sails and he was the rudder on the ship of life. What a beautiful description of your relationship. Isn't that gorgeous? He was the sort of man that never was jealous of any kind of adulation that I got from the audience. And in fact, backstage, when people would come for signings of, uh, of their program or a book or whatever, he would say, there's a couple of people over here who were too shy. Come on over, Ruta, talk to them. That's the kind of guy he was. And if he had to wait an hour or two for me to get out after the theater, that was fine with him. He was truly, truly a loving, beautiful man. And what a gift to my life he was. I've had so many precious gifts and friendship, but to have this adorable man that added so much to my life and to be able to say goodnight to him every night and wake up in the morning and have him there was absolutely a delicious gift God gave me. And uh, I miss him terribly, but I, I don't weep at his thought. I smile at his thought. I grin at his thought. And I'm very, very grateful. And I must say that I, I'm that way about most of my darling friends, so many of whom have gone on before me. I'm jealous of the fact that they're all together, but I don't want to join them just yet. I'll join no, them later. No, please, <laughs> please don't. But I want to tell you something, Ruta, when I read uh, your book, which I've now read twice because I loved it that much. You know, Webb was a very lucky man. You wrote very candidly in the book. A lot of people had affairs in Hollywood. You must be aware that you've always been one of the most beautiful, gorgeous, sexiest women in Hollywood, but you knew how to be friends with men. You were the girl they could go out with and have a beer. Yes, you that's exactly you, true. You weren't having affairs with men. You were their friends. Either I was too stupid to recognize a pass, or I was smart enough to ward it off and laugh and make a joke out of it and keep that person as a friend rather than insulting him by saying hands off, stranger, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I, I truly did sit around with the guys on the sets and everything else and, and swap stories I wasn't shocked by the language. They weren't shocked by mine. It was a great feeling to know that I had these guys in my corner without their hands grabbing at my parts. You know, that was kind of good. So I'm very grateful that uh, I did develop these wonderful friendships and always kept it on that level. And I don't think my husband was ever concerned about me once, I remember, that I was paying attention to somebody in Mexico a little more than I was to him. And he got a little bit disturbed. And I must say, it kind of tickled my fancy that it disturbed him a little bit because he was always so bloody placid about everything. So it was great fun. Well, you know, when you do write that next book, I think there's a lesson there that you could teach people. I always hear people complain that they don't know how to be friends with the opposite sex. They don't know anymore what is appropriate behavior, what isn't, what constitutes making a pass, what doesn't. And you really 
in an era where there were really very few rules in a community like Hollywood, where everybody knows how loose everything was, you found a way to navigate that ability to be friends with some of the most appealing and handsome and famous men in the world. Well, you're right. It was the era of the casting couch. And fortunately, I never had to lie on it. <laughs> and so I don't know whether it was just that I was that clever or smart. I don't know. Maybe the prayers that I said at night helped me during the day as well. No, I, I think you're being humble. I think you gave off a vibe that basically said, maybe I have everything I need at home. And you were able to be attractive and fun without trying to be um, enticing or seductive. You knew how to draw that line. And it's a very commendable quality in someone's personality, especially in that milieu, I think. Well, that is so nice of you to say. And when, when I stop and think about it now, you're right. That seductive come hither thing. I did only on film or the camera, and I didn't do it in person. Uh, uh, that's my goodness. You're the first person that pointed that out. Thank you. Now I know where some of it came from. Uh, very interesting. Well, when you take a look at Webb, why in the world would you want hamburger somewhere else when you're getting steak every <laughs> night? <laughs> and you know, he headed up a company called Bonanza, the steakhouses all across the nation. And you know, when you say hamburger, he started out as a counterman as a kid for McDonald's and then wound up executive VP of McDonald's. And then he went on to Bonanza and that's when I got him. And wow, he certainly was the prime steak in my life. And, and, uh, what a fabulous marriage we had. Absolutely wonderful. And the, the nice thing about Webb was that he never questioned what we had to do. He knew that my life was involved with a lot of people and a lot of events and a lot of appearances and all of that sort of thing. And all he'd say when I'd say was, we're, we're, we're out tonight at, at seven, he'd say, okay, where are we going and what do I wear? And that was it. <laughs> And do you know how fabulous that is not to have somebody sitting there bitching, saying, why do I have to go and, and what for and what good is it going to do and what's in it for me? He never, ever, ever did that. And so wherever you are up there, my darling Webb, thank you. Because you were the sales and he was the rudder. And there's another flip side to that coin. You never had to worry that he had a roving eye, that all these Hollywood starlets would be throwing themselves at him. Which is quite amazing because he was a very attractive man. I mean, he was a very good looking man. But look who he had at home every night. Oh, God love him. He, he was wonderful. He was the kind of person that if he walked into a, a cocktail situation and I was off chatting with somebody, he would automatically find probably the oldest and wisest person in the room and sit down and have a drink with that person and pick the brain and the heart and listen. And sometimes that's all people need when they're a little more shy is someone to listen to them, you know? And, but he just automatically did that. And uh, what a blessing. Well, Ruta, I have to say, I know everybody has regrets in life, but you strike me as someone who's truly content with your life. There's a serenity and an optimism and a sense of satisfaction about you. You've really had a terrific life, haven't you? I have. I, I made a lot of mistakes, uh, which I write about the coulda, shoulda, wouldas in, in my life. But on the other hand, here I am in full health, uh, surrounded by the beauty of my homes. I have several. I'm able to afford them. Thank you, God, because I learned the hard work and save your money ethic from my hardworking Lithuanian parents. I'm surrounded by friends that have loved me and I have loved for years. 
I keep friends forever. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful for everything nice that has come my way. And I have done my damnedest, especially through the Thalians, to give back to whoever needs the help that doesn't have the help. And I hope that God gives me many, many more years so that I can continue to do that. And to, I, I am blessed and I would like in my own way to be a blessing to somebody somewhere, somehow when they need it. Amen. Well, my dear, beautiful Ruta, I can't tell you how much it means to me that you took the time to come back on our show. You know, I absolutely adore you. I'm so grateful to be your friend. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And I love you and thank you to you and all your friends for looking at Consider Your Ass Kissed. It's such a fun read. And thank you for being my friend. I so look forward to an in-person hug and kiss. And to all of your audience, may God keep smiling on all of you. God bless you. God bless America. God bless Canada, my home sweet home. Thank you so much, Ruta. Our guest has been the incomparably delicious Ruta Lee. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.